Cuba, I think you can get books into Cuba. I'm not sure. I've never tried it. Um, so last, I think that, I think that's that's still okay. All right. Well, I'm really wanting to get us past the book of Ecclesiastes. So let's see if we can wrap it up today. We did chapter 11 last week. Let's see if we can get through chapter 12. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the Song of Songs. Uh, and then we're going to jump into Isaiah. And I actually printed off a set of study questions uh, for the book of Isaiah, but I left them all at home. <laughs> I actually printed it up for all of you, and then it never made it into my briefcase. Uh, but if anybody out of you are curious, I actually have the handout right here. <coughs> so I do have it. So next week we'll get that out to you. And if we got time today, I'll try to get you started uh, on that study. Now, for those of you that are new here, uh, what we're doing is we're going through the Bible, looking at all the texts that pertain to creation and science. So as you go through the book of Isaiah, I mean, it's a really big book. Uh, we're only going to be looking at those parts of Isaiah that address the topics of uh, creation and uh, science. However, let me ask you a question. In terms of all the books that you see in the Bible, all 66 books, how would you rank them in terms of their uh, content on what it says about the universe? Which book of the Bible do you think ranks first Job. in terms of what it says about the universe? Job, Job actually ranks second. Yeah. Yeah. Isaiah ranks first. So we're going to be spending a little bit of time in Isaiah because it actually says more about the universe and the history of the universe than any other book of the Bible. Uh, Genesis uh, comes in fourth, but hey, uh, and that's often what's interesting. When ever ask that question at church, people always say, it's got to be Genesis. Well, it's right. number four. Yes? That begs the question, who's number three? Who's number three? Okay. <laughs> Who can figure out what number three is? Psalms. Psalms. Psalms is number three. You got it. All right. And multiple Psalms talk about the universe, but it's Isaiah that really goes into it in some detail. Okay, chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes, and this is really the climax of the book. I mean, you've got Solomon writing these 11 chapters, and he takes you right up to chapter 12, and suddenly you say, now I understand what the book is all about. Uh, but again, for those of you that are new, what we've been doing with uh, Ecclesiastes is looking at it. I mean, there's a lot of content in this book, but the approach we've been examining is how frequently it talks about the Nabal, and that's a Hebrew word, one of the Hebrew words for fool. But it's talking about the fool who says there is no God. And so looking at the book of Ecclesiastes as a handbook and how to reach the person who thinks there is no God. And of all the books in the Bible, Ecclesiastes is really the best handbook uh, or guide on how to reach these kinds of people uh, for faith in Jesus Christ. Let's look at chapter 12, uh, verse 1. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. In other words, the time to think about all this is when you're young, not when you're old. Now, for those of us a little bit older, you might be a little bit depressed by what you're going to see in verses 2 and following. Uh, but just hang with me. Uh, there is some good news by the time you get through with this. It says, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come. So now it's going to tell you about what's going to happen to you if you get old, okay? Before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return uh, from the rain. Now, what it's basically talking about is what's going to happen to your eyesight as you get older. And again, this was written uh, by King Solomon before they had glasses and before they had contact lenses and before they had these surgeries that would keep your eyes functioning. So kind of put yourself back uh, 3,000 years before there was all this uh, uh, technology to keep your eyesight going. And so yeah, when you got older, uh, your eyes just didn't work as well. So that's what it's saying here. Uh, the sun appears to get uh, dark in the moon and because you look up at the, at the sky and it's also uh, blurry and the clouds return after the rain. When the keeper of the house trembles and the strong men stoop, 
basically saying your strength is going to wither away as you get old. And we could get some testimonies from older people here in the class <laughs> about how your strength has been waning. Now, you don't want to get those testimonies, okay? <coughs> my wife always gets after my case because, you know, I go for a morning run every day. Uh, but what I've been noticing, the time that it takes me to do that run is getting longer and longer as I get older and older. Well, it used to take me 25 minutes. <coughs> now it takes me 40 minutes. I mean, boy, that's depressing to think about and just how rapidly that had happened over the course of a few years. That's basically what Solomon's talking about here. And the keepers of the house tremble, the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease uh, because they are few, and those looking through the windows grow dim. It means when you look through the windows, what do you see? When the doors in the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when men rise up at the sound of birds, but all the songs grow faint, so it's something happens to your hearing. I was just sitting down here while people were enjoying treats and the gentlemen behind me were talking about you know, how they're now getting a little older. So I, I was listening in, guys. <laughs> and uh, how the hearing isn't quite what it used to be when you're in your 20s, okay? And uh, what's interesting as you get older is your hearing, you can still hear volume pretty well, but if three or four people are talking, it's really difficult. Remember when you were 20? Six people could talk and you could hear all the conversations. Now that you're 50, 60, you're basically saying, please, one person at a time, because <laughs> it all gets the noise. I can't filter out the noise like I could uh, when my ears uh, were much younger. Okay, when all, uh, it says, when men rise up at the sound of birds and all their songs grow faint, when men are afraid of heights and of dangers in the street, basically was referring there to what happens to the mobility of your limbs. Suddenly you're worried about, hey, you know, I'm not as stable as I used to be. Now, you got to get fairly old before you begin to notice that, that, uh, hey, I fall a little more easily than I used to, and I have to actually use the banister. I mean, when you're 20, you just zip up the stairs, right? You don't worry about hanging on to anything. Uh, but when you get older, uh, that becomes a problem. Um, and the almond trees blossom, and the grasshopper drags himself along. Now, it's really not talking. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's using a word picture here. It's not saying the grasshopper is dragging himself along. It's basically saying when you get older, you're going to feel like you're a grasshopper that's kind of limping around the room uh, because of what's happening uh, to your physical body. Then man goes to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the street. Basically saying, you're going to see all this happen as you get older. And guess what that is? It's a signal that your life is about to come to an end. Okay? Now, it's interesting when he's making the point here. The fool who says there is no God reaches that point in his or her life and doesn't think about the fact the grave is coming soon. They don't think about that. And because they don't think about that, they're missing out on the most important issues of life. And so how do we reach these folks? And basically, it talks about Remember him, referring to God, before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken. Again, it's using word pictures here. Basically making the point, what you need to say to the young man or say to the young woman who's 60 years of age and just beginning to notice that things aren't quite what they used to be when she was in her 20s, this is the time to remind them, hey, you need to remember God before things start to get a lot worse. There's still gold and silver in your life, basically saying there's still things you can do, but there's going to come a time when the gold and silver will not be there. This is now is the time you need to actually think about God, think about what's going to happen to you, realize death is coming, and realize everybody lives after they die. I mean, you just don't disappear. You will live after you die, but you get to choose where you live after you die. That's a choice. You need to think about that before the silver and gold are gone, before there comes a time when you can't think about these things. Yes, Tim. Oh, yeah. Okay. What's happening here is Solomon is using a lot of metaphors and word pictures. But yeah, that's included. If you keep going on, it talks about the fact there comes a time when you're not going to be able to think about these things. And so it says, remember him, referring to God, 
before the silver and gold is severed, or the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered in the spring, or the wheel broken in the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So it's using all these word pictures saying, all this decline is going to be happening. And it's not just physical decline, it's mental decline. Your eyes, your ears aren't going to be working like they used to. And it's basically making the point, when you're young, you've got the capacity to efficiently assimilate light from God. You say, you look, if you read John, the uh, Gospel of John, it begins in chapter 1. God is light, and his light has gone out into the world. And it's the same John who wrote the epistle, uh, the first epistle of John. And I've said this before in the class. When I would lead people to Christ and we get a whole bunch of brand new believers, what I like to do is take them through first. The first book I, sh I, I share with them is 1 John. Because you read chapter 1 of 1 John, it talks about how God is light, and we've all received that light. Uh, but the new Christian begins to wonder, what is this light that God's talking about? And then John begins to break it down. Chapter 2, he says one of the components of God's light is that God is life. And basically refers to how the second person of the Trinity is the one that bestows life upon humanity, those who want it. And then chapter 3, God is love, referring to the role of God the Father. He's the one who takes responsibility uh, for bestowing love uh, upon those humans who desire it. And then chapter 4 says God is truth, referring to the role of the Holy Spirit. Basically giving you a formula. God's light equals God's life plus God's love plus God's truth. This is what God wants to do uh, for the person who's just decided to give their life uh, over uh, to him. Now basically what you got here in the verses 9, uh, pardon me, 6, 7, 8, and 9, is basically saying in verse 1, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Remember your creator when you got all of your faculties, when you got your maximum strength, your maximum mental capability. Okay. When do you have your maximum physical capabilities? What age? Yeah, if you're a male, it's 25. If it's a female, you get it a year early, 24. That's when you're at your, uh, basically your, your physical peak. Okay, when are you at your mental peak? When is your brain the sharpest it's ever going to be in the course of your life? And for men and women, it's about the same age. Yeah. 30? Yeah, it's about 27 or 28. And you kind of see that when you look at the, the great mental achievements of human beings. Now, if you look at the great geniuses of the world who've made these incredible advances, uh, yeah, it kind of falls around that age. And so Einstein, yeah, when he was in his uh, you know, mid to late 20s is when he made his amazing, uh, likewise, uh, Richard Feynman, I mean, Nobel laureates have made these amazing uh, discoveries. Uh, that's when you're at your mental peak. Now, what happens as you get older than your late 20s is that you be actually uh, have another advantage. You're storing up knowledge. You're gaining truth. And so, yes, your brain may not be as brilliant as it was when you were 27 or 28, uh, but you won't be as ignorant as you were when you were 27 <laughs> or 28. And so... There's a real advantage uh, to being 70 or 80 years of age because God has given us a brain that has a tremendous storage capacity. And so you're able to store up a huge amount of knowledge. And what Solomon is talking about here in Ecclesiastes is not just a matter of knowledge, it's a matter of wisdom. And if you read the very end of chapter 12, he talks about how you can marshal that knowledge for wisdom. But Steve. I, I love you. <laughs> I love eating my you fish the for you. Uh, you have the advantage of that paper being photocopied while you uh, bring it back to you with some copies for everybody. Oh, would people love that? I mean, Steve yeah. is actually volunteering to do that. All right. You. And then next week I'll bring a bunch more. So if you want to, because what I've noticed about the class, whenever I do these handouts, is that uh, 
whenever I do these kinds of handouts, it seems like they just keep disappearing. <laughs> so uh, I'll, what I've discovered is whatever the attendance is in the class, multiply by four. That's how many handouts we're going to need. <laughs> so but we'll get enough going uh, to get things started uh, for today. So thank you, Steve, uh, for taking care of that. Okay. Yeah, where were we? Talking about the fact, okay. Uh, when you're in your late 20s, your brain is at its most brilliant that it's ever going to be in the course of your life. And so that's the time where you really need to be thinking, how can I take advantage of the fact that I'm at that point? And there's a reason why uh, you know, people typically get their PhDs at 26, 27, or 28, and they do their thesis work. I mean, that's kind of the peak of when their uh, brain is going to be its maximum capability. Uh, but you don't retire. Because after that, what we notice is uh, your brilliance capacity declines very slowly. But what mounts quite rapidly is your accumulation of uh, knowledge. And as Solon points out here, uh, if you're a follower of, of God, it's not just knowledge. It's applying that knowledge for wisdom. And so what we see is, and this is one of the reasons why most scholars believe this book was written by Solomon, he immediately jumps into all the Proverbs he's written. And of course, I mean, as it says uh, in the historical books of the uh, Kings and the uh, Chronicles, he was responsible for composing <coughs> over 3,000 Proverbs. So we just have a select number of these in the book of Proverbs, but apparently he composed a lot more. So he was applying the knowledge. But that didn't happen when he was in his 20s. Uh, it takes decades after that uh, to accumulate uh, enough, you know, accumulate enough knowledge and application of that knowledge. But basically the exhortation in this uh, few verses we looked at is get started when you're young. It's a mistake to think, you know what, I'll pay attention to God uh, when I get into my later years. And a lot of people think that way. That's kind of the strategy of the fool who says there is no God. A lot of them say, well, you know, there really is a God. Um, and, you know, there will come a time in my life after I've enjoyed everything when I'll actually start paying attention to God. And basically King Solomon here is saying that's an enormous mistake. Start when you're young. Because in terms of building wisdom, your ability to take knowledge and convert it into wisdom requires a relationship with your creator. And so yeah, you may have a lot of knowledge uh, when you're 60, 70 years of age. Uh, but if you've not really submitted your life uh, to Christ and have a relationship with God, you're, you're going to be behind the eight ball in terms of turning that knowledge into wisdom. And basically, Solomon is saying, get started when you're young. Don't ignore God. Don't put off God. Don't put these things off until you're older. Now, there's other reasons why you should do that. Number one, as we've already looked at in the chapters eight and nine, you don't know when your life is going to come to an end. I mean, here you are in your 20s, at the peak of your physical performance, the peak of your mental brilliance, and you might think, well, I've got another five, six decades to go. You don't know, young man or young woman. You may have an accident when you leave, and uh, you could be on your way to the morgue. Uh, you just don't know what's going to happen. All the more reason, don't put it off. And that's kind of a summary of this chapter 12. Don't put it off. <coughs> take care of this when you're in your youth. And the advantage is if you take care of it when you're youth, you're going to be able to convert all that knowledge that you're accumulating into wisdom. You can't do that until you have that uh, relationship uh, with uh, your Lord and the Savior. And there's every advantage to getting started uh, when you're young. And a lot of what you see here in uh, Ecclesiastes is a testimony of Solomon getting distracted. And that's kind of a message it's got here, too. Don't let the good things of life distract you. Because there will come a time when you mean you have all this great physical capacity. He's basically saying, I guarantee that you're going to see some physical wearing down of your body as you get older. And if you don't believe that, young man, young woman, go talk to somebody in the room here who's 40 years older than you are. They'll tell you, hey, you know what, it just doesn't work as well as it used to. And uh, there is a decline there. Uh, now, having said all that, there's every advantage to exercise. Physical exercise and mental exercise. 
And incidentally, there's new scientific research that demonstrates that if you combine the mental with the physical, it enhances the physical. So for all of those of you who want to have a great uh, body and you go to the gym all the time, you'll actually do better at the gym if you're simultaneously engaged in mental exercise. So just a little tip there for all of you who want to uh, you know, get into shape at the gym, combine it with mental exercise, it'll actually enhance it. And guess what? The converse is also true. If you want to maintain a sharp mind, if you want to avoid getting Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, this is no guarantee, but the research that actually shows if you can combine regular physical exercise with mental exercise, uh, your odds of avoiding dementia as you get older are significantly better, better by more than a factor of two. So it works both ways. Now, you had the first hand up. Go ahead. Yes, he wants you to prepare, but he says, you know, this life is going to go by really quickly, and you need to get started uh, when you're young. In fact, I got a question from somebody on Facebook who is about 60 years of age, and her comment is, when you get older, does time actually run faster than it does <laughs> when you're younger? It says, you're a physicist. Is there actually something that happens in your brain where the clock actually runs faster? And I said, no, uh, there's nothing in your brain where the clock runs faster. That doesn't happen. Uh, but I did share with her what I got from Dave Rogstad, uh, who's uh, older than I am. And his comment was, uh, life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it disappears. So it just seems like it's going by faster. And you see that with young children, right? Young children think the clock really runs very slowly because they have all these decades out, and they just can't wait uh, for time to go by. Those of us who are older wish time wouldn't go by uh, quite as quickly as it does. Uh, I'm trying to remember who is second. Okay, I think you were second, Jim. I'm, I'm the next. Uh, no, you're, you're about fourth, but I'll get to you. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to, it's an anecdote. My aunt, who was lived to be 106 plus, and when I was at her 106th birthday party, I was sitting next to her, and she leaned, and I told her, I said, as I get older, I notice that the time goes by faster. And she said, Jimmy, I think that it was like two months ago we were in here for my 105th. <laughs> two months ago. So it goes by six times faster. All right. <laughs> Okay, good point, and uh, yeah. What kind of, uh, I like this one, the prayer and pushing the Bible verses down? Okay, what kind of mental exercise is really going to help? Mental exercise that makes you do things mentally more than you think you can do. I mean, that's what happens at the gym, right? Yeah. You, I mean, we have actually got a, a professional trainer here. You're a professional yeah. trainer. Yeah. I'll bet you that's what you do with your clients. Exactly. You, you want to go through failure, so to speak. It's right. Yeah. You want to challenge yeah, take them a little bit past what they think they can do. Well, same thing with mental exercise. And so if you've never played chess before, you know, play chess. Uh, if <laughs> or, you know, mathematics. I mean, just stress yourself. <laughs> you knew I was going to say that, right? <laughs> or, you know, just, just reading material that's above your, your reading level. And so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like my books, right? <laughs> Actually, I try to work really hard to bring the reading level down. <laughs> so, uh, laughter is good, yes. So, learn a language, okay, uh, or learn a computer language. I mean, I can tell you as a really good mental exercise is coding a computer. So, have you ever uh, programmed a computer before? And people say, well, gee, I have a hard time just programming my VCR. Okay, well, <laughs> but that's the whole point. Uh, stress your brain, uh, your mind to do things that's beyond what you think you can do. While Pardon me? While oh, I'm not saying you combine the mental. Okay, I don't want you being on a treadmill where you're trying to do uh, calculus at the same time. <laughs> uh, 
You do it at different times, but the whole point is, in both cases, you're engaged in regular physical exercise and regular mental exercise. Although, I'll tell you this, when I go for my morning run, I'm doing mental exercises as I go. You know, so I'm actually you know, doing things, because I figure, hey, you know, why waste the time? Uh, let, let's you know, think through some problems uh, while I'm out there. So, okay, Steve, you're next. Okay, what about, what about I heard, I heard statistics say that if you say things backwards, you can avoid Alzheimer's too. Well, I know you're, you're very good exercised at that, so uh, <laughs> we'll see how it works on you as you continue uh, to get older and older. I can speak backwards. Well, okay. Yeah. But you're making a good point. So, for example, uh, you know, one mental exercise I did when I was on a, ment on a run, I said, you know, I'm going to work out cubes while I'm running. So, one cubed is easy, that's one. Okay, two cubed, what's that? That's eight. Uh, three cubed, that's 27. So, I tried to figure out how far I could go before I finished my run. So, that's just one example. But it's similar to what Steve is talking about. Think about doing things backwards. So, you know, uh, start with squares, cubes, I mean, uh, or work on the uh, puzzles. Uh, my wife likes to look at Sudoku puzzles. And I says, well, why don't you go from the ones that are not just 9 by 9, but 16 by 16, and then go to the ones that are 25 by 25, and then go to the ones that are 36 by 36. That's what I mean. Stretch your mind to do things you think you can't do. So, yes. Diet is very important too, sure. Because I read a book about, uh, about a neurologist. He said that in the next 20 years, there will be more people with Alzheimer's because they're eating too much sweet. And sweet causes inflammation of the brain. And fresh food, like strong food and all of that, is very bad. Yep, I mean. Many carbohydrates. <coughs> well, one reason why there is an obesity crisis today. It's not just that people are eating the wrong foods. They're not doing mental exercise. They're not doing physical exercise. Yeah, those are all important. So combine all of that. And also something that's been noticed is that people who have a relationship with Jesus Christ and are actually in regular fellowship with fellow uh, individuals that have that, uh, they typically live about eight years longer than the rest of the population. So hey, keep coming to this class. It's going to help you live longer, right? <laughs> Eat fish every Friday, okay? Well, fish. <laughs> oh, you're eating your own fish, okay? You're eating I your pet fish, okay? Fish that is interesting. So, anyway, I'm not going to get into a diet thing. This is not what this is all about. We're we're actually looking at this text here, uh, but it says, "Meaningless, meaningless," says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Everything is meaningless if you don't pay attention to the God that wants a relationship with you. And your life is meaningless until you do. So basically saying, yeah, the fool who says, you know what, I'm just going to put off this God thing until I really need to, like when I'm 60 or 70 or 80, then I'll pay attention to him. Uh, your life is meaningless until you make that step. All you're doing is eat, drink, and be merry. And what is the meaning of all that? And so your life will not have meaning until you take that step. And notice how frequently the book of Ecclesiastes repeats that phrase. I mean, all the way through. And that's basically uh, a tip that he's giving us. When you're engaging people who think that there is no God, or live their life as if there is no God, or put off the God thing until they're uh, coming close to the grave, uh, basically what uh, Solomon is saying over and over again, you need to communicate with that person the meaningless of their life. And you can do that by asking questions. I mean, you know, a book that I'm working on right now, I tell a story of being on an airplane across the country. And seated right next to me is a very successful businessman from Montreal. Now, how the conversation got started, he says, well, where are you from? Because he knew I was living in the U.S. He says, well, I was actually, I'm from Canada. And he says, well, where were you born? I was born in Montreal. That got the conversation started. And so he began telling me how great his life was. 
uh, how he had this thriving business. He had a summer home up by the lakes uh, north of Montreal, had a nice home in Montreal. Uh, he had a family, wife and kids, and uh, everything was great. And uh, he says, I just can't think of anything I want that I don't have. And uh, so I just asked him the question, well, what is your purpose uh, for living? And uh, he said, you know, I told you I had a great marriage, uh, but just two weeks ago, my wife basically told me, if we don't develop some purpose in our life and our marriage, I'm going to leave you. And he says, I told you my marriage is great, and our marriage has been great, but my wife basically expressed him, we've been married for 30 years, and we haven't developed any sense of purpose or meaning uh, in our life or in our marriage. And he said, sitting beside you, I basically realizing I need to do something about this. So he said, do you have any advice? So we <laughs> talked for the next two hours. <laughs> <coughs> he wound up giving his life to Jesus Christ right there in the airplane. <laughs> so, and uh, there's a bunch of people behind us listening to the conversation. They actually were standing up behind us, wow. leaning over so they could listen to what was going in. You know, that happens on airplanes. So, uh, but the whole point is, it's the counsel he got here. What I was doing was reminding him, hey, yeah, all this has been going great in your life, but what is the meaning, what is the purpose? And he realized, you know what, I've been putting that off, I've been ignoring it, and that's a problem in my life. My wife is talking to me, and now you're talking to me. I need to do something about this. But what he told me was this. His wife basically challenged him. But he said, I didn't get any help uh, from her on what we could do about it. Her solution was, well, I guess I'm just going to have to leave you. And he said, that's not what I wanted to hear. And he said, I had no idea where to go to get meaning and purpose. But it's interesting, as we closed our conversation off, what he told me was this. I really wanted to find someone who could give me a sense of meaning and purpose in life. And here we are on the airplane, and he says, do you think God answered your prayer? He says, I don't even think I was praying, but I knew what my heart wanted, and it all happened. I said, well, I think you were praying. You just didn't know it was prayer. <laughs> yeah. Doug. Um, every day, more or less, I, on Facebook, on a page for atheists versus theists, I talk to atheists, and um, this topic came up about hell and about death, and all of these different atheists, I mean, well, like 30 of them, they responded, they don't think about it, they don't worry about it, and it, it just seems like they're just intentionally sticking their head in the sand. So it confirms what you're saying, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, and I remember uh, when I was at that uh, International Skeptic Society conference, talking to the atheists afterwards, and because, uh, you know, they, they threw a hypothetical question at me. I said, okay, I've got this grandmother, and she's lived a, a good life, uh, been generous towards people, uh, but uh, she's never uh, become a Christian. When she dies, does she go to hell? And, uh, you know, basically they were trying to get me to say, well, yeah, if she doesn't submit her life to Jesus Christ, she goes to hell. And I said, well, it's her choice. She gets to choose where she gets to spend eternity. And if she wants to spend eternity, with the creator of the universe, which is Jesus Christ, and wants to submit her life to him and enjoy a relationship with him, that's where she's going to go. But if she wants nothing to do with the creator, then God's got another place for her, and that's a place where she'll never have to engage God for the rest of eternity. It's her choice. It's not that God sends you to hell or sends you to heaven. He gives you a choice. Where would you like to spend eternity? But guess what we're seeing here in the book of Ecclesiastes? We need to challenge people to think about that while they still have all their faculties. You know, it's a bit rough uh, when they have dementia. And it's a bit rough when they can no longer get out of bed. And uh, they can no longer hear. They can no longer see. That's where we're getting these first few verses. It's basically telling us a time will come in your life if you don't die in an accident if you don't have your life snuffed out when you're youthful. But I mean, if you're dying of natural causes, there'll come a time when your sight's gonna go, your hearing is gonna go, your mobility's gonna go, your mental capabilities are gonna go. And it's too late. You need to think about this stuff 
and think about where you want to spend eternity. And so, and God gives you a choice. And basically, if you live your whole life uh, thinking, well, you know what, I'll pay attention to God later. What you're basically saying is, I want nothing to do with God. And so you'll get to go to the place where you'll have nothing to do with God. Because after all, you've lived 80 years, and that's how you've lived your life. You lived your life as if there was no God. And so you'll be spending eternity as if there was no God. You've made that choice. And so you know, people talk about, it's unfair for God to send people to hell. Well, it'd be unfair to have you, God send you to a place you don't want to go. And that's kind of a story I wrote out in Beyond the Cosmos. You know, here's this individual who's been in hell for one trillion years. And then an angel goes and visits that person and says, how do you like this place? I don't like this place. You know, I thought I'd be playing poker with all my buddies for the rest of eternity. And what they want to do is do me physical harm all the time. Uh, I had no idea that all these other people would be as wicked as I am. Uh, so, and, you know, that's the real problem of hell is the company you've got to keep. And, uh, but the angel says, you know what, I can take you to heaven on one condition. That you agree to submit your life to the authority of the creator of the universe for the rest of eternity and enjoy a relationship with him. And that person who's been in hell for one trillion years has said, that would be greater torment than staying where I am right now. Please don't force me to go to heaven. And so, yeah. Because basically God, and this is something you know we also saw in this, these uh, chapters in Ecclesiastes. God keeps you alive long enough to where you either become a captive of Christ or a captive of Satan. And yeah, I see your hand, so please, your comment. I already answered your question. <laughs> I was going to ask, um, what happens if your life gets cut short before you come to that realization you're too young to be touched? Good question. And uh, the book of Isaiah we're going to go to next actually addresses that question. But uh, check out Isaiah 58. It actually talks about the person who dies in their youth. And, uh, you know, we got a handout called God's Mercy and Death, which talks about the four eventualities. Someone who dies way beyond their years who is righteous and really is anxious to spend, says, you know what, I, I really want to go on to the next life. And you know, I've met lots of people in that condition where they're like in their 90s and they just say, I'm ready to go. And, but God makes them stay. And basically God does that because there's unfinished business. God keeps you here until you finish the task to which he's given you to do. And basically God is saying to that person, you may think you've accomplished everything I want you to accomplish, but you haven't paid attention to X. I'm going to keep you alive long enough until that gets taken care of. And then there's the person who lives decades beyond the normal years and has lived a very evil, wicked path of life. But basically, God keeps that person alive because there's still a chance they might repent. So he gives them that time they need to repent. Okay, what about the young person who, say, is 30 years of age and gets killed in an accident? What you'll see in Isaiah 58 is that sometimes as people ponder, why is it that the good die young? And we all know people who have lived exemplary lives and really committed to Jesus Christ and yet they're taken away in their youth. What you'll see in Isaiah 58 is this. God knows the future of every human being. And in that future, if God sees that there's torment, uh, that's going to be very uh, unpleasant uh, for that person, he takes them home early. Basically says, I'm just gonna take, he says, in the analogy I've used, um, this happened to me once when I was an undergraduate. <coughs> I was in this examination room, and it was actually cold, so we all had to wear gloves as we were doing our tests, taking the gloves off, and we had to do uh, the complicated uh, math. The exam was three and a half hours, and it was a pressure exam. I mean, we all knew we couldn't finish. The professor walked beside me after I'd been there one hour, just sweating uh, all the way through trying to get this done. He takes the paper away from me and says, you can leave basically says, I already know what grade you're going to get. There's no point you staying here and suffering 
you can exit out. Okay? God does that sometimes with people that are young. Basically saying, you know, you've already done great. There's no point in you staying here any longer. You've taken care of what I want you to take care of. And if I let you stay any longer, you're going to be experiencing torment I don't want you to experience. You want a biblical example of that? I'm going to ask you a question. Can you think of a good biblical example of someone that should have died when God wanted them to die, but he went on living? Hezekiah, Hezekiah right. Remember, God went to Hezekiah and said, Hezekiah, get your household in order. You're going to die. He was 39 years of age. I won't ask you how many of you are older than 39, okay? I won't do that. He was 39 years of age, and God told him, get your household in order. You're not going to recover. You're going to die. And the story is, Hezekiah pleaded with God day and night with bitter tears, saying, Lord, look at my record. Look what I've done in your behalf. And please, give me more years to continue uh, the good work that you've called me to do. And because he pleaded so incessantly, God says, okay, I'll give you what you ask. You've got 15 more years. What happened in those 15 years? Manasseh. Manasseh was born. Okay, if he had died when he was 39, there would have been no King Manasseh. What does the Bible say about King Manasseh? Number one, he ruled longer than any other king of Judah. And he was... Yeah. He was evil. And the nation fell into evil. But that's not the end of the story. Because after all, God did give Hezekiah those 15 extra years. What happened at the end of Manasseh's life? He repented and found the Lord. But it was too late for the kingdom of Judah. Because for decades, there had been this wicked rule uh, from the throne. And it impacted the entire nation, and the nation did not recover. They wound up going into exile as a result of what happened during Manasseh's reign. Now, that story is in the Bible basically to teach us all a lesson. When it's time to go, God knows the best time for you to go. And don't fight him on it. Go when he tells you it's time to go. And hey, if you're 39, he says, hey. And keep in mind, it's graduation. You get to go to a much better life. And so, hey, you know, thank you, Lord. I don't have to stay here any longer. That's why I use that analogy of being in the exam room. It's like the professor came by and said, you don't have to stay here any longer. So I got to go, and I got two hours of extra study for the next exam I had to do. <laughs> okay? And that was a little less stressful than being in the exam room uh, trying to get through all those uh, problem assignments uh, in that short uh, period of time. Uh, but then there's the other analogy, the wicked person who gets snuffed out early in their life. And you say, hey, why didn't God give that individual a chance to repent? Because God knew the future and knew there was no possibility that that wicked person was ever going to repent. So what does he do? He takes them away early. How is that a blessing? If you read to the end of Revelation 20, Revelation 20 tells us those who want nothing to do with God will go to the lake of fire. But in that lake of fire, there are different levels of torment. Those who have done little in the way of evil but have still lived a life apart from God and want nothing to do with God, they will not be tormented to the same degree as those that have done much evil. And therefore, when God realizes this wicked person is not going to repent, he takes them away early to minimize the amount of torment they'll have to experience in the lake of fire. Because as I explained in uh, Beyond the Cosmos, the reason for the torment in the lake of fire is to keep that individual from making the situation worse for everybody else in the lake of fire. Everybody gets tormented to exactly the right degree that's necessary to keep that uh, individual from making life far more miserable for all the other inhabitants in hell. Some will need more restraint, some need less restraint. And that's basically how our prison system works. Uh, we torment people in prison, and torment's the wrong word. We basically restrain them. But the restraint is not pleasant, and some need to be restrained more than others. 
And isn't it interesting how the great tyrants of the 20th and 21st century all got snuffed out relatively early? I mean, how old was Hitler when he died? He was 56. Yeah. And likewise with Joe Stalin. Uh, he died way before his years. But it's like, hey, those individuals who lived any longer, look at the damage they would have done. And I see we got Dave here standing up telling me my time yeah, is up. No pleading that going to give you extra time. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> he's not going to treat me like Hezekiah, all right? <laughs> That'd be great. It's very powerful. I mean, I, I, this will be my 10th memorial service that I, I, I'm doing every in a couple of weeks here. And a lot of times your, your teaching on God's mercy and death is really a help in talking with people that have lost loved ones. You know, well, Dave? God's timing is God's grace. And this is that, especially I had a coworker who had you know, their young daughter. Daughter passed away at four years old. who was distraught. And, and sharing God's mercy and death Really, really helped him where he was getting no help from anybody else. In fact, his Buddhist priest was saying it was his fault, you know. Oh, wow. And, and, and has, showing those Bible verses and talking about God's mercy is just so powerful. But with that, we do need to close in prayer. We do need to close in prayer. So, well, thank you for bringing that. And I'll tell you this, Dave. Every time I do a funeral, I bring those handouts with me. Because what I notice is I, I, I have my few brief comments, but people just taking home those scripture passages. They read them, and it makes a big impact. I've had a lot of people, after I'd done funerals, call me two, three weeks later saying, you know that, that set of verses you handed out? This particular verse really ministered to me. And it's like, okay, just give it out there and let God's word uh, bear fruit. With that, let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for this 21st century where we can live stream this class to the world, and thank you, Lord, that, that we can engage people uh, through this amazing technology. <coughs> and Father, I pray you'd help all of us uh, to become uh, more sensitive to when you give us opportunities to give reasons for the hope that we have uh, in, uh, in Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to communicate with that, with that with gentleness, respect, and a clear conscience. So as you go away from here, Lord, I pray that each one of us uh, would mature in developing uh, more reasons and the better reasons and become more sensitive to seeing those opportunities and to be Christ-like in the way we distribute them. 